Welcome to the Survivalist Podcast with Mark Buhali, Doc Montana, and Matt Gould. In each episode of the Survivalist Podcast, we look at different events and catastrophes that could happen to you. Then we give you the knowledge, resources, and recommendations you need to survive. The Survivalist Podcast is brought to you by Forge Survival Supply. In an era of uncertainty, Forge Survival Supply provides more than emergency supplies. We bring you and your family peace of mind. Use the promo code SURVIVAL at checkout at ForgeSurvivalSupply.com for 10% off your order. This podcast is sponsored by Epic Water Bottles and Pitchers. Every year, millions of Americans get sick from drinking contaminated water. Epic water filters remove chlorine, heavy metals, chemicals, industrial pollutants, pesticides and herbicides, iodine, and microbiologicals from your water. This is done with BPA-free, recyclable bottles and pitchers that are made in the USA. So keep your family safe and healthy with Epic Water. You can use the promo code WATER at epicwaterfilters.com for 10% off your order there. One other thing, please rate this podcast wherever you listen to it, whether it's Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever. Please rate us. It's very important to us, and we really want to know what you think. And thanks again for listening. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Survivalist Podcast. As usual, I'm here with Doc and Mark. And we have a special guest today, Richard Duarte. Richard is a fantastic author. He's the author of Surviving Doomsday and Quick Start Survival. And I think these are two essential books for people who live in urban areas. And uh, Richard, I was taken with, in your intro to the first book, Surviving Doomsday, you talk about the percentage of people who live in urban areas in America. A lot of times what we talk about on this show is uh, bugging out and living off the land, which I think a lot of uh, preppers think they'll do in the case in the case of a shit hits the fan moment or a uh, what you call WCS event, Richard. But tell me about people who live in urban areas and why they have to think differently. First of all, it's great to be here. I really appreciate you guys inviting me on the show. It, it's a pleasure always to, to join you guys and to have the opportunity to share some of this information. I started with uh, my preparedness lifestyle back in 1992, right after Hurricane Andrew wiped my, 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 my house off the face of the map, and we barely walked out with the clothes on our backs the following morning, and that was a very loud wake-up call for me. I, I, I talk about that experience. I write about that experience in, in my first book, and anybody who's interested in the details can, can look that up, but... Um, Basically, it changed my life and it changed the way I looked at things. So when I when I first started uh, this, and I call it a lifestyle because preparedness is not something you can just do and forget about. It's something that you have to work on constantly, and and it evolves. You you have to try to uh, make it. All the time, you have to try to improve on the, the, the preps that you've made. You have to improve your skills. It, it's, it's an evolutionary process. And when I first started, I, I kept reading information that said the only way to be safe is to have 40 acres in the middle of Montana and move off the grid and, and do all these other things that I knew were impossible for me. I, 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 I had a family in, in South Florida. I had extended family. I had businesses. There was just no way that I can pick up and leave and go someplace else as much as I may have wanted to. So I very quickly realized that I had to make the very best that I could of the circumstances where I found myself, and that was in a very busy urban environment. And not a lot was written back then about the urban environment. There was a lot of books on bushcraft and wilderness survival and off-grid survival, but very little on urban. So I I almost had to sit down and figure out what was going to work for me. And that I did over a period of years through trial and error, mostly error. I would I would try something. If it worked, fantastic. If it didn't, I, I had to move on to the next possible solution. And even when it worked, I, I had to keep refining it to figure out, was this the best possible, possible way to do this? So really the main focus of, of my books is, um, you know, there's, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is that, you know, we all live in a very dangerous and unpredictable world. Urban dwellers are especially vulnerable. And, you know, when bad things happen, it's, 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 it doesn't, you know, you can't pick the circumstances. It's going to happen when it happens. Uh, but the good news is that all the information that we're going to talk about today, all the skills, all the gear, uh, all the preparations, they're easily within the reach 
of the majority of the population. You don't have to be a survival expert. You don't have to be a Navy SEAL. Uh, you don't have to have special forces training in order to prepare yourself and your family to be as, uh, as safe as you can reasonably be, uh, given the circumstances. And the, the, the simple answer for when people ask me, well, what's the answer? The simple answer is you have to focus on the survival basics and you have to get started. You can talk about this from here to you know eternity. If you don't actually take that first step and get started, nothing's going to happen. My circumstance, I've talked about many times. I live in New Jersey, just outside of New York City, and I work in New York City every day. It's about as urban as you can get. And, uh, and very different than, than Mark and Doc. But uh, so what, what's the percentage of people that live in circumstances, you know, like mine, very urban areas? It's hard to say exactly, but I would, I would estimate based on everything I've seen, probably a good 80 percent of, of the population lives in either an urban or a suburban environment. And suburban environments are almost as bad as the urban environments in that they, you know, folks that live there are almost totally dependent on uh, utilities. They're dependent on uh, all their supplies, their, their, their essentials being brought in from someplace else. And then you've got this concentration, this massive concentra- concentration of people that, uh, for some reason or another, they all wait till the last minute whenever something happens to, to, to secure the things that they need. We see that down here all the time with in South Florida with the hurricanes. Even though we've had a ton of hurricanes over the years, some devastating, you know, like Andrew Category 5, uh, others much less so. You see it the last day, uh, the, 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 right before the storm hits, the, all the big box retailers, all the supermarkets, they'll be swamped with people. It's almost like the world is coming to an end, and they have to get that last gallon of water. They're fighting in the parking lot over the parking spots. Um, you know, most folks don't even have a flashlight in their in their drawer, so you see them uh, all these things disappear off the shelves and almost immediately, and and it's and it's a it's a massive struggle just to get in and out of these places. So you know, I, I look at this and I say to myself. But this is something that happens every year. The hurricane season is from June 1st to November 30th. Even if there is or isn't a hurricane, you still have to be prepared. Why not do that in advance? But yet, you know, there it is. It happens every single year, and then you have that mad rush. So just imagine if that's, if that's because of, of, of a natural disaster that's announced days in advance. Imagine something that comes out of left field that just wasn't expected by anybody and affects you in a severe way. Uh, and then you've got all these folks that basically are not going to know what to do or, 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 or how to protect their families, and they, they're lacking even the most basic supplies and skills. So, Richard, let's, let, let's play that out for a moment. Let's say there is some unforeseen natural disaster in a highly populated area, like maybe where you live. What do you see the first couple of days looking like? Pandemonium, um, chaos. To begin with, I think a lot of people put a tremendous amount of their reliance on first responders, government, governmental agencies, relief agencies. They, they rely on them to the point where it's almost unrealistic or is unrealistic. Some of these agencies work very well. They're very efficient. They're well run. Others are not. And even when you have these, these agencies that are prepared and they're ready to go and hit the ground running, um, if the disaster is big enough, there's just no way that they're going to be able to cover uh, all the ground and all the folks that need help. Same with the police, the fire, any other first responders. They're going to be stretched to the maximum. So I think especially the first few days, given the number of people that are uh, unprepared and that don't even give this topic a second or even a first thought, um, there, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to be waiting for help that's never going to come. And there are also going to be a lot of victims. And when you say victims, yeah. I notice that you certainly don't shy away from defensive uh, tools um, in your books. Can you elaborate a little bit on um, on what you think might be needed in some sort of a urban situation? Well, I, I've always said it, and, and, and I think I've made myself very clear in, in, in both my books and in all my writings. I think that security and self-defense is job one, always. Because without security and self-defense, nothing else really matters. Uh, I always get people that stand up and say, "Oh no, but water—you got to have water, and you got to have food, and you got to have, uh, you know, first aid." And I say, "Okay, all those things are 
absolutely essential. But what good will any of them do you if you're seriously injured or dead? And then they look at you and they're like, oh, wow, I didn't think about that. You know, when I'm thinking security and self-defense, I'm not thinking in those terms. And I'm like, well, those are the terms you have to think of because we've all seen the aftermath of hurricanes like Katrina, Andrew, um, where you have massive looting. Uh, you have people that go out and hurt other people and take the things that they need or want just because they can. Uh, we had looters in our neighborhood half an hour after the storm passed. That, that, that's in my book, and, and, and I included that because I want people to realize just how quickly some folks will mobilize, not to help others, but to be selfish and to commit crimes and to do the things that they want to do because of selfish reasons. So, you know, security and self-defense is a big deal, but I'm also very careful to point out that that doesn't mean that you run out and buy a gun and now you've taken care of that. You can check that box off. Uh, security and self-defense means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And uh, uh, certainly a weapon is, is part of that. And, and, and I advocate for that. I'm, I'm a big Second Amendment uh, proponent. And I think that everybody needs to take this seriously. But um, how about the simple things like maybe securing your home, creating layers of security, uh, making sure that your doors and windows, you know, you're, you're creating layers between yourself and, and possible threats. Um, do you have a deadbolt, a good deadbolt? Do you have security film on your windows? Do you have maybe a dog? Uh, have you even thought about any of these things? And if you do get to the point where, yes, I, I need a firearm, well, then it's your responsibility to make sure that not only you get that firearm, but that you get the proper training. Because buying a firearm and thinking you're secure is like buying an instrument and thinking that you're a, a musician. Uh, if you don't know how to use it correctly, you're probably going to end up hurting yourself or somebody else that you don't want to hurt. Uh, but you're not going to be effective with that firearm. So th th it's a lot more complicated than just, well, you know, guns and ammo. So That's a theme that comes up over and over again, Richard. Yeah, it's almost like a little knowledge is more dangerous than, than no knowledge at all. <laughs> so, uh, Richard, I do have a question um, that maybe uh, will help um, Matt out. I sometimes run short of ideas on, on alternate weapons besides guns for urban environments where there might not be the um, the, the governmental support for personal ownership of such things. Right. You have um, ideas? Yeah, and, and if I may just back up just a little bit, um, one of the first things I, I advocate for self-defense is situational awareness. I always tell folks it's easier to avoid a problem than it is to figure out how to solve it once it's in your face. So the, the first weapon, if I may, is, you know, to be vigilant, to pay attention to your surroundings, to be cautious, um, to pay attention to what's going on so that maybe you can sidestep uh, a potential uh, problem. Uh, but if you can't, then you have to be prepared to move forward with, uh, with force, with determination, and with confidence. And whether it's a magazine that you've rolled up into a makeshift baton or something that was in the room that, you know, maybe has some weight to it that you can use uh, as, as a striking uh, an object, something that you've planned ahead of time, like maybe some pepper spray or, or, or something non-lethal or less lethal, way before anybody could ever get there to help you, you have to be in a position to be able to help yourself. So if you live in a state that allows you to possess a firearm um, and you're comfortable with it and you have the proper training, fantastic. I think that's the best case scenario. But if you're limited in any way or you frequently find yourself in a location that doesn't allow you to bring a firearm, well, then you've got to look for alternate ways. I do that all the time when I get on an airplane because obviously I'm not going to bring my, my firearm. I can't bring a knife. I can't bring any of the things that we would traditionally associate with self-defense. So I got to look for things that I could use if I had to other than my bare hands. We need to make ourselves hard targets with cell phones and everyone going a million miles an hour. Uh, we have to make sure that we're focused outward. Like you said, Richard, we got to keep our situational awareness pretty much at all times, especially uh, I was talking to some female friends of mine about – the book I wrote and the things that uh, that I like to do with regards to survival and preparedness, 
I'm like, well, one, you're in the state of Texas, so you should have a firearm. Well, I don't know if I should have a gun. And I was like, well, then you need to be, you need to have either a mace, taser, a baton. Your purse could be a weapon. But the key is make yourself a hard target and focus outward so you're not inward. Uh, there's been some videos on Facebook as of late that people are reach a, a woman's going to get pump gas and guys are in the like the next lane next to them and they pop into the car, steal the purse and drive away. Right. So just or they're hiding behind their car and then get in the car. So, again, just being aware. And like I said, we're going a million miles an hour. We all have things we're doing during the day. But when you focus inward and you don't you forget about your surroundings that's when you're, you could get attacked, attacked, things could get stolen, you could get hurt, uh, kidnapped, raped, especially, you know, as a, as a female and someone who's a father of a daughter, I'm constantly talking to her about awareness and being able to, when you talk about practice, reaching in her purse and pulling out her mace and getting ready to blast a guy in the face, kick him in the balls, punch him in the throat, and then get out of there. And uh, practice, practice, yep. practice. And I want to add that uh, it's not a political thing. You know, a lot of times uh, it seems like it's people that are on the right that are pro-gun and people that are on the left that are anti-gun, especially where I live in New Jersey. It's very uh, liberal. And, you know, the thing is, it, the violence is happening everywhere and coming from all sides. It does seem like random violence is on the rise. And, and, and no matter what, uh, no matter what place on the political spectrum you are, you got to be ready for this. Right. And I, I write about survival and I'm very careful never to include any of my political views because I'm a human being. I have them, but I, I think they have no place in my writings because um, survival is is neutral. It, it has nothing to do with gender or race or political affiliation. When a disaster happens, we'll, we're all in it together. And uh, whether you survive or not doesn't doesn't depend upon what you believe or how you believe it. It depends on how you've prepared yourself and to some extent how you use those knowledge, that knowledge and those preparations to your advantage. So, um, you know, I want to reach as many people as possible. And I, and I don't care if they're on the left, if they're on the right, if they're in the middle, uh, because some of those people are my neighbors, my immediate neighbors. Some of those people are my not so immediate neighbors. But the fewer people that are out there in a desperate in a state of desperation, the better because those are fewer people that I'm going to have to contend with when something happens. So it's, it's, you know, this is because, you know, I write and I do what I do because I don't want people to have to go through what I went through back in 1992. And I was extremely lucky, but just because I was lucky doesn't mean that other folks are going to be lucky. I want them to have a fighting chance. And like you said, Richard, the key why we're doing this is to get to stimulate thought, right? To get people thinking about survival and preparedness and oh it's not going to happen to me we're not going to have bad weather in south texas we're not going to have it in florida we're not going to have a hurricane again we're not going to have a massive blizzard in montana we're not going to have anything in, in new york or new jersey that's going to shut down the city well if you think like that you're you're one of those ones who's going to maybe die in place waiting for the government to come help you and feed right. you and keep you warm and so again like you said you got to think about it and you got to start, even if that's just like going to the grocery store and, and buying an extra gallon of water or taking martial arts or thinking about if you're out in a more rural area, how could I start a defense in depth at my at my house? How can I have early warning if if gangs are coming out from the city to come to my home and rape, pillage and burn and get all my food and my supplies? And I really like your concept with, with defense because we talk about that in the mili military all the time about having layers upon layers of either early warning or uh, what are called phase lines in the battle space to, to allow you and or people in your party to react to a potential threat and take out the threat or turn the threat or have them be like, okay, this is a very hardened area and I don't want to go mess with these people because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose numbers. I'm going to hurt myself or people are going to die for me trying to go see what's in this, you know, this space. Excellent. Richard, you talked about, uh, you said that you gave a, a recent talk on 10 preps you should make before the end of the year uh, for urban survival. I wonder if we could 
go through those and and we'll say it's 10 preps you should make in early 2017 for urban survival. Can you take us through those? The next part of the Survivalist podcast is brought to you by the Perry Blade Survival Knife. Designed by SAS legend Mel Perry. For more information, visit perryblade.com. That's perry, P-A-R-R-Y, blade.com. Yes, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it quickly because this was like an hour presentation, so I'll, I'll do it quickly. And then if you guys have any questions on any particular ones, you can stop me and let me know. But uh, uh, number one, the, the number one prep that I that I advocated for in this presentation was security and self-defense against the first priority. And, you know, the reasons for that is obvious. Um, I encouraged folks to go home, uh, look at their layers of security and to work on those things and imagine, you know, go on the other side and imagine, you know, how would I penetrate these layers if I was on the other side and what can I do to shore up any vulnerabilities? And again, we talked about situational awareness and how important that is. Um, firearms and ammunition, um, that was number two. I absolutely recommended folks uh, go out and secure whatever it is that they felt that they wanted to have or they needed. Um, remember, this was made prior to the election. So we, you know, that recommendation was based on the uncertainty of, of, of what was going to happen uh, during the election and where we might end up and the availability of some of these things in the not so distant future. But just because the election went one way and not the other doesn't mean we can let our guard down. And it certainly doesn't mean that we should say, uh, well, I won't get it now. I'll get it later because I don't have the cash or, you know, if you need something and if something's necessary for your security and self-defense, get it now and make sure you have enough of it uh, and make sure that you've tested it and that you're uh, comfortable and proficient with those tools that you're going to use in, 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 in those situations. And very, very important, seek out and get the proper training. I can't stress that enough because, again, without training, um, you're not going to be effective and you're probably going to be more dangerous than anything else. Tell me about the training. So uh, let's say you get, you know, you get yourself a, uh, a handgun, you get a nine millimeter Glock 19, and you take a course from a uh, from a range instructor. What else would you recommend to do in terms of training? All these skills are perishable. So if you go and you take a class and then you put the gun away and it's nice and shiny and you just want to keep it nice and shiny and you never go out and practice the skills that you've learned, um, it, it's not going to do you a whole lot of good. I mean, it's better than nothing, but it's not going to do you. The, it's not going to get you to where you need to be. So part of the part of the the equation is to take a class, get the training, learn some of those skills. But the other part of that is to practice and go out there and see what works for you because all of us are different. Um, I, I trained with an instructor once that, you know, he never fully extended his arms um, when going into the isosceles. And, you know, everybody always wondered why, you know, he had a defect in his arm, so he couldn't extend his arm all the way. And he had to figure out a way around, you know, and still be effective. So everybody's going to be different. Some people's vision, you know, is not the same as others. Uh, maybe this guy is left-handed, the other guy's right-handed. You know, everybody's going to be completely different. Um, so you've got to find what works for you. And at the end of the day, what matters is that that round end up where it needs to be, regardless of how you get it there. All right, number number three, uh, make a plan and test it. Um, and when, when I say make a plan, uh, a lot of folks get – confused. They think, well, why do I need a binder in my closet with a bunch of pages in it that contain a plan? Negative. It's not about the binder in the closet with a bunch of papers in it. It's about going through the process of creating that plan. That, that, that's where the, the gold nuggets are. That's where the jewels are, because it forces you to sit down and think and analyze and plan. Uh, writing it down is just the gravy. But if you go through that process, um, you'll learn things and you'll discover things that you didn't even think about before. And when you test it, you'll actually figure out what works and what doesn't. So it's a process of planning, testing, revising, planning, testing, revising, what works, what doesn't, what's fantasy. There's a lot of fantasy out there. Um, you don't have to go far to find it. It's on the internet. It's on YouTube. It's, it's, it's in books. 
Um, I, I laugh sometimes because I, I read some of this stuff and I, I go like, well, yeah, maybe in fiction, maybe in a Rawls novel, but, you know, not in life, not in real life. It's not doesn't work that way. So anybody who's putting any kind of uh, reliance on this information, you know, they're in for a rude awakening. One thing is fiction and, and one thing is reality. So you have to test what works for you and what doesn't. There's no substitute for firsthand experience. And it's like you were saying before, I've done wilderness training classes where I've gone out with this wonderful knife that I thought was going to be awesome. The knife of all knives. And it ended up being a piece of crap. It didn't work. It didn't it didn't do what I needed it to do. And then I, I had this little thing that I bought on Amazon for 20 bucks, and it was fabulous. So, again, you have to test it. You have to take it out of the packaging. You have to put it under uh, real-life conditions, and you have to see what, uh, what works and what doesn't. To run through that, Richard, so, I, uh, so you're familiar with New York, and so I'm in New York right now. My family's in New Jersey. So when you say run through the scenario, you mean, like, pretend there is a worst-case scenario event that happened, and I've got to get home without public transportation and try to do that. Is that yeah, and, and, and you don't have to recreate it exactly. You do the best you can. Um, instead of maybe taking the highway, you know, I would recommend, uh, drive home, uh, you don't have to walk home, but drive home using some of the side streets that you would have to walk, go through some of the neighborhoods that you would have to go through, uh, see what's there along the way, you know, try to plan alternate routes so that when the, 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 the thing actually, if it happens, if, when it does happen, uh, you're not you're not navigating blind. You know, one of the things that I neglected to mention before in the get home mat bag was a map and a compass. Uh, it's on my list, but you know, again, you forget these things. Um, very important because uh, you don't need so much uh, a compass in an urban area as you would in a wilderness area, uh, but you still need it because if you're in neighborhoods that you're not familiar with, well, you know, which way do I go? I need and it again, more. <laughs> yeah, well. I mean, if you're in the middle of the wilderness and you look around and everything looks the same, all the trees look the same, you know, uh, 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 you have to have a compass in those situations. If you know that an avenue runs a certain way and a street runs another way, you more or less know just by looking at, at the street signs which way is north and which way is south. But you still may not realize that, you know, this may connect and that doesn't unless you have a map and a compass and, and you're able to navigate some of these uh, terrains. But um, again, if you could run through that scenario in a way that tries to at least gives you a flavor of what you would have to face under one of those uh, situations, you at least have some comfort with the situation as opposed to doing it for the first time when a, when a, when a disaster strikes. Okay, great. So we're on number uh, four now, right? Four is create a knowledge base. Uh, I encourage everybody to start their own survival library. Uh, this could be survival reference books. Um, even some fiction is really good because it allows you to place yourself in a scenario that you may not normally encounter, but that the, 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 the subject of the story has to navigate through. And this individual is faced with problems and has to find solutions. And you may actually find some good information in some of those solutions. I've read books that I've said to myself, this is fun to read, but it's all fantasy. I've read other books where I said, wow, I could use this. This is good information. Um, I encourage people to take notes when they go to presentations, to print out information that they find online uh, and organize it and put it into binders. Um, a lot of people keep stuff on Kindle or some other electronic device. I think that's good if you want to carry a lot of information from point A to point B. But remember that you have to have a power source for that. And if the power fails, you better have a plan B. So I also like, I'm, I'm old school. I like books. I like to tab them. I like to highlight them. And I like to be able to have something physical in my hand that I can rely upon whether there's, there's electricity or not. So, but the key is to have uh, the, the knowledge base available to you because, again, we cannot remember all this stuff. And there may be things that we need to access quickly, information we need to access quickly. Um, and if you have these reference sources uh, available to you and you're familiar with them, you'll be able to put your hands on the information very, very quickly. Yeah, very good. Very good thought. Number five uh, is learn new skills. Uh, we all get complacent. We all get comfortable. Um, we live in, a, in an age where a lot of things are done for us, so we really don't have to know how to do them ourselves. But I 
ask people to think outside the box, and I ask them to imagine a, a scenario where uh, those first responders, uh, those police officers, uh, all those other things that we rely upon so heavily aren't there, and you have to take care of your own immediate situation. So I encourage folks to take a first aid in the medical class, uh, learn CPR, um, self-defense skills, uh, firearms training, navigation with a map and a compass, uh, and then practice your skills. Uh, don't just go to a class and, and, and forget about it. We, we've, we've had uh, classes where we learn certain uh, survival skills, certain medical first aid skills, and then we practice on each other. Uh, and every so often, oh, uh, somebody will say, oh, I forgot about that. Well, you know, this is why we practice. This is why we do this every so often. And you don't have to make it uh, an event where everybody dreads, you know, oh my God, we're going to do one of these again. No, you know, try to make it a fun thing. Try to make it an educational thing as much as possible. Maybe introduce new gear, new equipment, uh, talk about things. Um, don't do it to the point where everybody's sick of it, but do it often enough that if something should happen, everybody has some familiarity with what you're talking about. Number six, uh, stocking up on resources, food, water, medical, uh, a lot of times people will ask me how much food and water. Well, it depends. It depends on a lot of things. But um, normally I recommend 2,000 calories per day per person and two gallons per person per day of water. Why? A lot of people recommend one gallon. I recommend two because especially in, in, in areas of the country where it's really hot or uh, where you're exerting yourself, you're going to need more water. Can you do with less? Yeah, absolutely. But if you can plan for two, uh, you, you've got a little bit of a cushion and not only that, but if extra people show up at your house, uh, you always have that extra water and people will show up and these will be your friends, your relatives, you know, good luck turning them down. I mean, I hear people say it all the time. Well, no, nobody's coming over my house. Ah, you know, it, you know, people come over your house. You're not going to turn them down. You know, you're going to be a human being and you're going to do the best you can to help them, um, especially your friends, your neighbors, your, your, your relatives. You know, at least that's what I'm going to do. Uh, so store more than you think you'll need. Uh, yeah. Don't underestimate the needs figure for, you know, last minute drop ins. Uh, I recommend at least a 30 day minimum of, of food and water. Uh, if you can build it up to 60, 90, you know, 90 days and then maybe even six months, that's even better. But, you know, once you go beyond that, then, you know, it's 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 a job to keep all that stuff uh fresh and rotated and organized. And uh, so, you know, it, it becomes more of a commitment. But I think if, if you're able to start with 30 days and build on your efforts, I think that's a good start. Um, I focus to me, to me, even 30, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but to me, even 30 days of water. So I have a family of five, two gallons right. a piece, 10 gallons a day, 30 days, so we're at 300 gallons of water, right? So right. I, I don't even know how I would store at 300 gallons of water. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's, it's not easy. And, and for example, I have a swimming pool and I could use some of that water for certain purposes and I probably would. Um, but uh, there are some really good products uh, on the market nowadays that allow you to store the 55 gallon drums uh, sideways horizontally. And uh, by filling the bottom drum, it also fills the top drum. I did a story on that not too long ago. It's going to appear on my blog probably uh, this week. And, um, you know, there, there, there are all kinds of things that you can do, uh, but again, it's a challenge, and water is very heavy. If you live in an apartment or in a condo or maybe even a townhouse in a large urban area, you're going to have to really think through this and find some imaginative ways to store as much as possible. Uh, it's not going to be easy, and uh, even rotating some of this water, because you can't store it indefinitely, uh, is going to be a challenge. But again, you know, how much do you value your life, and how much time is it worth to put in to try to protect yourself and your family. Yep. So. And doc, last week we were talking about that specific scenario in Missouri and, and you were talking about specific brands of food. Can you remind, remind us what that is and how many you'd need for uh, 2000 calories a day? Um, I, depending on how you want to store the stuff, I use a lot of the freeze dried mountain house and I actually like it. I mean, I'm one of the, maybe the few people and I don't even have to cook it all the way either. But uh, 2,000 calories. Each each package um, actually says either how many servings or and or how many calories or both. And uh, depending on uh, if it's a calorie dense uh, meal, obviously you're going to get more calories in a smaller amount of space. 
Um, but that's the one that I use, and then you vary it. So I usually start out with some core meal and then have a couple of sides, which are also small pouches. And then if I carried that out, you know, that times five days, 10 days, 30 days, um, and pretty soon I'm up to the, you know, buying the big cans, the number 10 cans, uh, which I wrote the article about. And then you get into both, not only 30-year storage, but you can start mixing and matching them. And that's, again, I, I would encourage people to, just as Richard's saying, to try this stuff out. Instead of saying, I need 2,000 calories and measuring out what 2,000 calories would probably be, you get an idea of what survival life is like. If it's cold, you're going to need more. If, it, if you're lounging around, you're going to need less. Right. Um, and then you're going to have to balance it out for what people, you know, younger kids or older people are using. And you don't want to have a lot of waste. You don't want to have any waste, actually. So yeah. you could eat. Uh, in cycles, so whatever's left from the first from the kids goes to the adults, and then the adults supplement theirs. So there's a, there's a lot of ways around it, um, but that stuff's a, I think a lot easier to store uh, because it's smaller, but it's of almost no use without water. And I agree with that 100%. Um, and in fact, what I recommend is calorie dense, shelf stable, ready to eat food that requires little or no preparation. Um, because when you're stressed out, the last thing you want is to be cooking. And you may not even have a situation where, you know, you can cook. So, you know, to have a pouch that you can pour some hot water into and eat it, that's fantastic. Yep. Yeah, I also chose a, to live in a place that's got three main rivers kind of intersecting. So up out in the mountains. So No, uh, that's good for you, Doc. But you reminded us what it would look like in uh, on the Hudson with, you know, 10,000 people fishing if, if it was a worst case scenario event. And, and, you know, the other thing is not to forget uh, folks in your group that may have special needs, the very young, the very old, um, folks that have medical conditions that may be on certain types of, uh, you know, restriction, dietary restrictions. You have to plan for all that. Prescription meds also you have to plan and keep enough of that on hand so that even if you can't go to the drugstore next week to refill your prescription, you'll be okay. All right. Sorry, Richard, I'm slowing you down. So, No, 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 no problem. Uh, number seven, uh, health and wellness. Um, I encourage folks to keep up their health, to get uh, yearly exams if possible, to stay on top of any medical conditions they may have, uh, dental exams, uh, take care of and address chronic conditions. In other words, address any health needs that they may have prior to um, a disaster or a crisis situation unfolding. Why? Because Murphy's Law, again, uh, if your condition is going to flare up, it's going to flare up at the worst possible moment, especially if your health is not in the best uh, condition. So it's up to you to make sure that you're as healthy as possible going into one of these scenarios. Uh, can something happen? Absolutely. But, you know, you have to do your part to try to mitigate any damages um, and the more you do to keep yourself healthy, the better you'll be in, in one of these situations. Yeah. And I know, Mark, you talk about that a lot too, right? You talk about armchair preppers who have everything but are, you know, 50 pounds overweight, and what that's going to do to them. Guys have all this high-speed gear. Like, Richard, you mentioned this too. I bought this cool pistol. I bought this cool knife. But they don't practice with it. Or they think they're going to be, an empl be able to employ it in every any given moment. They think they're going to be able to put that load on their back and... What if their house is burning down? How are they going to evac with that and their family? How are their kids going to put their bug out pack on and hike 3, 5, 10, 15, 20 miles if they've never practiced? How are they going to employ that firearm? How are they going to reload? How are they going to handle a malfunction if they've never practiced? And with the sugar coating again, oh, the government's going to come help me. They're going to take care of everything. No one's ever going to get hurt. I'm never going to twist my ankle. I'm never going to break anything. I'm never going to get sick in a survival situation. That's all sugarcoating and fairy dust, and it's not reality. Yeah. That um, if I'm bugging out, I, what if I have a fever? What if I'm sick? What if I have pneumonia? What if I'm down for the count and, oh, shit, something bad's happening, and I need to get out of Dodge. I need to mobilize. I need to protect myself. I need to protect my daughter, my family, et cetera. It's um, – Thinking through those scenarios, like you mentioned, that, oh, we think everything's going to be fine, but having multiple contingency plans, at least you've given it thought so you can steer in one direction or the other when something bad happens. Yeah. And, and you be, practice, again, with your gear. You, and the, be realistic. 
Yes, be very realistic. And um, if you're out of shape and you haven't done any damn, if you haven't, if you're a couch potato or you work at a desk, I mean, and I'm not faulting anybody who works at a desk because a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people work at a desk and that's how we, that's how they make their living and support their family. But if you've never, if you haven't worked out and you're going to put a 50 pound pack on your back, uh, you could, you can go into heat exhaustion. You could have a heart attack. You could, you could be, you could become a liability instead of an asset to your loved ones right. and or right. your survival friends if you yeah. haven't practiced. And, 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 you and didn't a sharp bot. It. I'm sorry? I said you didn't realize it, but you just covered point eight. <laughs> yeah. Yet a sharp body leads to a sharp mind. Yeah. You know, the more fit we are, we, we, we work better. We're more efficient. Yeah, and that was and that was uh, point number eight: physical fitness and survival conditioning, which really encompasses not only the personal fitness, the health, but the mental fortitude. And you know, it, it covered a lot of that stuff, which is you know you're going to be asked to you know by the circumstances you're going to be required to take on loads and to perform physically in ways and mentally also in ways that you never imagined. And you have to be prepared for that. And not only you have to assess your abilities, but you have to assess the abilities of all those in your group. Because it's not like you set off with 10 people, you know, you have 10 folks in your family, and, you know, grandma starts lagging behind and, oh, well, you know, she can't keep up, we're not going to take her. You know, yeah. that, that one person is going to slow down the entire group, and you have to plan for that. Yeah, of course, you're not going to leave her behind, and you're not going to carry her, but you're going to have to uh, account for that in your plan. So, you know, one of the things we, we advocate very strong, strongly is eat well, exercise, control weight, monitor all medical conditions, and try to stay healthy. And every so often, go out on a, a family hike and see how far you get. Even without carrying 50, 60 pounds on your back, see how far you get before folks start giving up because, you know, their, their, their feet give out or their endurance gives out or they just can't do it. And now you've got a realistic assessment of what you can plan for and what you can't. So if you know that that's not a possibility, then you have to make another plan. Yep. Good. Very good. Number nine, not a lot. We don't hear a lot about this. Number nine and 10 are a little bit unusual, but they, they reflect my background. And number nine is financial planning. Um, and one of the things that I told folks at this presentation was assess your financial situation. A lot of us operate under the assumption that Tomorrow, the stock market is just going to be just as vibrant as it was yesterday and today. Uh, my bank account is going to be there for me. I don't need to carry around any, any cash with me because I have three ATM cards and seven credit cards. Uh, I don't have to have a nest egg because I'm fine. Um, if I need money, I'll just put it on my credit card. So, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these um, assumptions uh, are very dangerous, number one. And number two, they assume that certain things are going to be in place that may not be in place. So I, I, well, some of the recommendations I made was, you know, number one, don't put all your eggs in one basket. I'm not a financial planner. I'm not giving anybody financial advice. Let me be really clear on that. But, you know, as, 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 as somebody who, who writes about preparedness and, and part of preparedness includes financial to some extent, um, you know, you want to be safe. You want to avoid risks. You want to plan for the unexpected. So I encourage folks to have a rainy day fund to avoid debt as much as possible, to avoid overextending themselves and living above their means um, for two reasons, because it reduces stress, number one, and number two, because it allows you to really spend your money in the most effective way possible and maybe to afford some of those preps that you always keep talking about but never make because you can't afford them. Um, I encourage folks to stay away from plastic, stay away from credit cards. They're really convenient, but when the power goes down, uh, they're worthless. So I encourage folks to always have a supply of cash on hand uh, in their pockets uh, just in case you're caught in a situation where uh, the power is down and you need to get from point A to point B or buy water or food or a pair of shoes or whatever. Cash is always going to be king in many situations, especially a short-term disaster. And folks will always, out of greed or whatever, accept the cash willingly. So if you have cash, uh, especially for emergencies, you'll be so much better off than that person who walks around with seven pieces of plastic in their pocket. And when they try to buy something and the system's down, you're out of luck. Yeah. 
So um, I also encourage folks to keep some silver, maybe some gold, just in case, as both as a hedge against inflation and also for possible bartering, although that would be an extreme uh, circumstance. Um, number 10 are legal preps. And again, something you don't hear too much about, but as, as an attorney, I can't, I can't leave that out. Um, most of us don't even think about this, even during good times. And we always assume that a disaster has to be this widespread apocalyptic thing that happens to everybody, but it doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes disasters are very personal. Let's say you suffer a very personal loss. Uh, that could be just as devastating as some widespread catastrophe. Uh, so I encourage people to think about what would happen if a primary uh, breadwinner were to be incapacitated or injured or killed. Uh, is there a will? Uh, is there a power of attorney? Is there a living will, advanced directives, an asset inventory to allow other members of the family to know uh, where to go and what to do and how to do it? Um, so I encourage folks to gather up all these important documents, to organize them, possibly scan them, uh, maybe put them on a, on a password-protected uh, drive or a USB uh, thumb drive, and to have access to all this important information in case something bad happens. And then also to have a plan for rebuilding or for reconstruction after a disaster. Let's say your house burns down. All your important papers were in the bedroom in a drawer somewhere and that burnt with the house. So now where do you start? What insurance company do you call? What bank do you call? Where are your statements? Um, you know, you need access to all this important information in order to start rebuilding your life. But if you have it, if you have it, it's going to be so much easier than if you have to start, you know, playing detective at that point and trying to figure out and retrace your steps and figuring out what do I do and how do I do it. So uh, I, I say that from personal experience because all my information was lost or maybe all of, uh, next to all of it um, right after Andrew. It, it, it blew away or, or it was damaged by, by the water that came into the house. So I, I say from personal experience, if you have an opportunity safeguard all this information. And if you don't want to put it on a thumb drive or uh, back it up on, a, on, a, on some other device, maybe uh, make copies of all of it, put it in a Mylar bag, seal it, and send it to a trusted friend someplace else far away from where you are or far enough away that they're not going to be affected by the same disaster that you would be affected by. And in the event of a disaster or a crisis or some other unforeseen event, you know, there's a second person that you can go to and say, hey, give me my documents back. All right. Thank you, Richard. That was uh, really good. Thanks for condensing the 10 into a shorter presentation. I think uh, we would love to have you back on the show to get more into the nitty gritty of uh, real scenarios. One thing we like to do is go through. Uh, I particularly, I know that Mark and Doc are more reasonable people and they're always interested in real disasters that could happen. I, I am particularly fascinated with uh, end of the world as we know it events. Um, so perhaps next time we could talk about one of those in, 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 in an urban environment, you know, basically the walking dead come, come real. We all love that stuff. You've been listening to the survivalist podcast with Mark Puhali, Doc Montana, and Matt Gould brought to you by survival cash, forge survival supply, epic water bottles and filters, and the Perry blade. Please visit our website, the survivalist for more information. One more thing, please give us a review of the show, either on iTunes or Podbean or Stitcher, wherever you listen to it, please give us a review. They're very important to us and they help us out a lot. And thanks again for listening.